The Philosophy and Limits of Science. Earlier this year, John Lennox produced a book, Can Science Explain Everything? Tonight, my question is, can science explain anything? Ultimately, what is it to explain rather than just describe? And my claim is that science is self-excluded by its own philosophical system with which it's, within which it's practised from providing ultimate explanations. It's, it's confined to providing analysis and understandings of the mechanical operations of a given functional predictable universe. As Carl Sagan said, if we lived on a planet where nothing ever changed, there would be little to do. There would be nothing to figure out. There would be no impetus for science. If we lived in an unpredictable world where things changed at random or very complex ways, we would not be able to figure things out. But we live in an in-between universe where things change, but according to patterns, rules, or as we call them, laws of nature. If I throw a stick up in the air, it always falls down. If the sun sets in the west, it always rises again the next morning in the east. And so it is possible to figure things out. We can do science, and with it, we can improve our lives. So to do science, we need an already regularly operating universe. And science is the study of that regular operation of that universe, which already sets up some limits for science. So if we can do science in this orderly universe, we need to be clear about what science is and what scientific knowledge is as distinct from other forms of study. In 1833, the word scientist was invented or coined when Whewell was pushed by the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge to describe this new profession of people working in the new laboratories with a particular form and subject of their studies. Previously, what we call scientific investigative work had been done by aristocrats and clergymen as a hobby activity and was known as natural philosophy. Those natural philosophies in their world work was self-funded, self-directed, self-published. This new 19th century breed of scientists were forming across the 19th century a paid, professionalised, institutionalised group of employees, which change had its advantages as well as its limits and dangers in, into the present day, as we'll see later. With the enormous success of the new studies in science across the 19th century, there was an obsession with labelling all new forms of study as a science to give each of them respectability and status, especially in Germany, and it's well do documented by the classical scholar Sandys. And this is how Karl Marx and Sig Sigmund Freud came to call their work science, even though nothing that they did was controlled or repeatable. So with this historical background, I propose that what we can, can be called science is only that study that is subject to controlled, repeatable testing. Thus, science can only be applied to the study of the mechanical behaviour of the material, mechanical parts of the universe in the present moment and involving testable predictions about what might happen in the future in a specific case. Yes, this is a very tight definition of science, but its benefit is that it excludes problematical areas of study which may be legitimate in their own right and have their own study methods, but they're not subject to controlled repeatable testing, which is the hallmark of what can be properly labelled science. And there are scientists who agree with me on this. Only that which is subject to controlled repeatable testing. Howard Georgie, a particle physicist, a theory that is not testable is non-scientific. All philosophical ideas are untestable and therefore useless. <laughs> A scientist's opinion on philosophy and philosophers, not the only one tonight either. 
So there are subjects that are not sciences. There are historical studies such as cosmology and paleontology. They're not science because there are no controlled, repeatable experiments that can be carried out on past events. Cosmology is the writing of a proposed history of artefacts lying around the universe, whereas paleontology is the writing of a proposed history of artefacts lying around the surface of the earth. Oh, there they are. And how Georgie, the particle physicist at Harvard, said, agrees with this. I think you have to regard cosmology as an historical science, like evolutionary biology. And he went on to say, cosmologists might acquire some much needed humility by reading the books of evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould, who discusses the potential pitfalls of reconstructing past the past based on their knowledge of the present. And I've found about six other scientists who say that same sort of thing. So there are limits to science. It's designed to pro probe physical reality, so it's limited to that part of reality. Unique events are outside science because controlled, repeatable experiments cannot be carried out on single events. Scientists may voice their opinions on such, re such reports, but science cannot speak or have an opinion on anything. Can science disprove a unique event such as a miracle? No. And again, a scientist out of their own belief system may postulate upon a unique event claim like this, but they can't study it. It's gone. <coughs> Nor can they nor can we say that the laws of nature exclude miracles because we don't know, as I'll show you later, what a law of nature is. Is it anything more than a mental abstraction from observed regularities? We have morality, aesthetics, social networks, cultural practices, political systems and positions, historical traditions, art, music, logic, maths, love, hate, literature, religions, justice, obligations, all in various combinations which are not matters of science nor of the scientific method. And Paul Kalanithi commented, science may provide the most useful way to organise empirical re reproducible data, but its power to do so is predicated on its inability to grasp the most central aspects of human life. Hope, fear, love, hate, beauty, envy, honour, weakness, striving, suffering, virtue. And Einstein, amongst others, said the same sort of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Alastair McGrath, some of you will know of him. There's nothing wrong with science. It's simply that its answers are important in some areas of life, but not in others. To deal with the complexity of life, we need more than science. To deal with the many questions and challenges of real life, rather than those played with in philosophy seminars, we need more than one conceptual toolbox. The philosophy of science, and we'll start back there with Aristotle. He believed in passive observation of things and events in the world. He thought that everything is composed of substances and essences, which was the basis of science throughout the medieval period. Aristotle also had a system of four causes of things and events. The fourth cause was the telos or the purpose of that thing or event. And this concept of telos or purpose will come back throughout the course. In the 13th century, Robert, Roger Bacon and Rod, Robert Gross Test, who were both English priests, showed that experiments could expand the opportunities to see what happens under different conditions from what nature provides, thus providing better discrimination between competing hypotheses. And Roger Bacon conducted his experiments with a system much like the falsification system that you'll later hear about from Popper. There he is about 12, 14 and so on. So Christian priests in the worst of the dark ages invented the idea of doing experiments. 
The modern philosophy was based on Francis Bacon 400 years after Roger Bacon and no relative. His philosophy was based on the ancient Greek materialist Leucippus, Democritus, Epicurus and Lucretius and I've highlighted Democritus because that's a criticism I have of an historian writing about him. Francis Bacon's philosophy of science was an Epicurean atomist materialist philosophy. This is a paradigm shift and you'll hear about paradigms later on. This is a paradigm, the only paradigm shift I've found of the whole of philosophy, shifting it from being interpreted within an Aristotelian system to eventually, certainly by 1709, being all interpreted and done within an Epicurean materialist framework. So in this move, Francis Bacon removed meaning, value and Aristotle's telos, purpose, from the work of science. Now, the removal of value, meaning and purpose from science makes it a dehumanised study. It's okay to cut purpose out of the consideration of rocks and raindrops, but to cut it out of biology, where living things obviously have purpose in their actions, and to cut purpose out of our own lives. So, oh. Some scientists go a bit strong on this. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. Nor will a final theory of everything provide humanity with any con guidance in conducting its affairs. And Richard Dawkins. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect of, the, of it. If there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, per pitiless indifference. But in finding no meaning, value or purpose at the end of their studies, these people seem not to realise that back around 400 years ago, in setting up the philosophy, the belief system of modern science, Francis Bacon declared that meaning, value and purpose were outside the remit of this new science. So you cannot, at the end of your study, find something that was ruled out at the beginning. Yes, Francis Bacon removed it all 400 years ago. So they don't know history as well as don't know philosophy. Stephen Hawking concluded his book on time with the idea that when we have the theory of everything, then we'll know the mind of God. But Hawking has no concept of purpose in creation. Does he have any, does he have no concept of person in the creation of his own scientific instruments? Alfred North Whitehead, you might recognise as the founder of Process Theology, had an interesting comment on these sorts of scientists. Scientists who make it their purpose to prove that there is no purpose constitute an interesting item of study. Back to Francis Bacon and his philosophy of science. He thought that philosophy of science is a matter of collecting data with no presupposition, then using induction to draw generalizations and explanatory principles, whereupon you collect more data to define the best, define the best conclusions or explanations. But this idea had problems. <clears throat> First of all, scientists don't work that way. They actually collect data with filtering and organizing theories. Data don't organise themselves into categories. A mind does. And induction fails because theories and explanatory principles are the result of human intervention, not just the logical results of data. Other problems developed as time went on, but I won't bore you with those in detail. And Francis Bacon himself seems to have only ever conducted one experiment with something to do with the frozen chickens in the ice in the, and snow last longer. And in conducting this experiment, he managed to catch pneumonia and die. <laughs> His idea of science was to exploit nature for human purposes. And people claim that this exploitation of, rabid exploitation of nature comes out of the Christian doctrine of our dominion over nature. 
But if you read Psalm 72, you find out what dominion really is about. A caring, looking after of all the down and outs and the poor and everybody else to make sure they get justice. So a materialist epistemology. What's an epistemology? It's the study of what we know and how we think we know it. And it's a major factor of philosophy, so I won't bore you with that tonight. (coughs) Locke in 1690 produced a materialist epistemology, one that's only based on the material functions of the universe. He said that we are born with no innate ideas. We are tabula rasa. We are a blank slate and the only information that we have to work on is that from our material senses. And the Marxists love this idea because it means there's no genetics or no materialist basis to anything we do. It's society that draws what the person is. Well, not with what we know of genetics now. Leibniz astutely commented that Locke had explained everything except the mind itself, as Dennett has done recently. And mind is still a problem, as I'll mention later. David Hume was next on the line. He said that the uniform of, uniformity of nature across time and space is logically and empirically unprovable. And he seems to have been the first to have pointed that out. And he also argued that we cannot know causation. All that we are able to see is a consistent sequence of events, a pattern, but not the cause of that pattern of events. So along came Immanuel Kant, who didn't like any of this. Against Locke, he said that there are various categories and principles of thought that are built into the very structure of our minds and in the operation of our perceptual apparatus, our sensory system. Against Hume, he said that the uniformity of nature is a principle built into us and is a principle by which all our experiences are organised. And also against Hume, he said that the concept of causation is also built into us. And you see this all the time in conversations when anything happens. People want to know why did it happen? What was the cause of it? That's a, a consistent question. So the results of Kant's study is all we can study and know are our own experiences. And we cannot know how our experiences, our observations, our sense information actually can connect or correspond with ultimate reality. All these philosophers were causing problems in the philosophy of science. And so in the late 19th century, the logical positivists invented this idea of verification. The meaning of a statement is dependent on its empirical verification with our sensory observations that was developed out of Locke and Hume. So if there's no empirical verification of this sentence, then it is meaningless. Bit of a problem. The statement itself is not verifiable. It's a self-contradiction. And when that was eventually pointed out, the idea died. Karl Popper came along with the opposite idea of falsification. He disagreed with confirmation or verification and he proposed the opposite, that scientific theories are those that can be falsified by empirical data, but it doesn't work, that idea doesn't work very well after a bit of enthusiasm and Popper later in his life said, actually, I think it only works in a few cases. (laughs) So the next big shift in the history of the philosophy of science was Kuhn in 1962, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And that book is the most quoted work in academic literature. All science is done and interpreted within a paradigm. A paradigm is an overarching framework of belief and interpretation of what is going on, how the world functions and what you think you're doing in it. And he said that the history of science is the history of successive paradigms. He developed this idea out of his analysis of the changeover in the paradigm 
surrounding astronomy in the belief system about how the universe operates from his study of the changeover from the Ptolemaic astronomy, the Earth-centred universe, to the Copernican astronomy in the Sun-centred universe. Now, I'd said that Francis Bacon had changed the produced a revolution, a change of the paradigm within which the whole of science is interpreted and there hasn't been anything like that since. What Kuhn is talking about is the changes in the belief system within which particular sciences are done. And <coughs> he really only studied that one changeover to produce this idea. He said that when you're doing normal science, that's when all the workers in that field simply accept the current paradigm or belief system for that area of science with all its problems and anomalies and they keep on working with that. A crisis state is a breakdown of a discipline when the current paradigm is overwhelmed by anomalies and problems and then a scientific revolution is a change of the paradigm, the belief system within which that branch of science is done and interpreted. It's a good theory. Darwinianism probably provided a changeover for biologists, but I can't think of any other idea where there's actually been a change in the paradigm within it which a science has done. Life waves, etc. Somehow must have some background medium which they yes. Have yes. Uh, there have been others, but I was scratching around at the time, and thank you. That makes me think of several others now. Rutherford's proof that the nucleus is concentrated in the centre, not spread around. Yes. Right. Right. Hmm. Consequences of paradigms. People believing different paradigms sometimes see quite different things and mean quite different things by the same word. And this has happened not within science but in the alternate world out there where they've completely changed the meanings of the word natural, chemical and organic. And when I ask these new ages who use these words in these new ways what they mean by them, I get very woolly answers that are never consistent. But that's where the word means something different within that belief system compared with what I think probably all of you and I know of what these words used to mean. Thus, truth in science becomes paradigm dependent. It's a relative truth and that's what the modern world wanting relativity in ethics and everything else loved about it. The traditional view of truth in science was that nature, as seen in the old paradigm, forces our theories into line and that seeing is believing because perception is passive. There's an imprint of objective information on our minds which has come through neutral sense organs. But Kuhn's view of science, truth in science, is that believing is seeing, that the perception interp and interpretation is an active process which is developed within the new paradigm. But nature can strike back. There may be so many anomalies develop in a paradigm that it has to be changed. And then came the science wars of the 1980s, 90s and noughties. This was a postmodernist outbreak against the hierarchical control of dead white males and their view of science. And this Postmodernism was hostile to science but had no coherent postmodern alternative explanation. Postmodernism claims that all other views are trapped in their chosen perspective and are playing a power game. Well, guess what? Postmodernism is also trapped in its perspective and is also playing a very powerful power game. So it falls to its own criticism. So the current philosophy of science is interesting. It's mostly a combination of Kuhn with the best of the earlier ideas and it's not without all its own problems. 
and philosophers love inventing problems in all of this. But philosophers of science generally think that science produces real knowledge about an objective reality, even though uh, through uh, or through a range of hum- even though a range of human judgments is involved. And for philosophers to say it's real knowledge and there is objective reality is an amazing statement, a couple of statements. So science is built on presuppositions, unprovable beliefs, the existence of a mind and theory independent external world, the orderly nature of that external world, the existence of truth and the reliability of our senses and our rational faculties or reason to gather truth about the world in a trustworthy manner. There are the laws of logic and the truths of mathematics which scientists use and there is also a belief in the adequacy of language including mathematical language to describe the external world. And there is a belief in the uniformity of nature across time and space which as Hume said is not provable. It's basic to it all. So there are limits at the start of science. Science can't validate the scientific method. It works for our purposes. That's the best we can say of it. Science can't validate the scientific method. It works for our purposes. That's the best we can say of that too. So science works within our philosophy, a belief system held by faith. We believe these presuppositions for doing science on non-scientific grounds. Therefore, science is not the only legitimate basis for believing something against the scientific people we'll meet later. Then we come to metaphysical or philosophical naturalism. Naturalism itself is the unprovable belief that nature is all that there is, that there are no supernatural persons or entities. This is the belief system of Hawkins, Dennett, Dawkins and others. Methodological naturalism is the method within which science is conducted by everybody. It's the belief system, the philosophical view within what we call science should be practised and interpreted. And this is a change from a philosophical naturalism to just using that belief system as a method for doing science. That's why it's called methodological naturalism. (coughs) And this belief system or philosophy is is only allows natural and unintelligent causes to explain the origin and operation of the material world. That's why it's naturalism. And that's the way everyone does their mechanical studies. People doing science within methodological naturalism need not believe in the metaphysical or philosophical naturalism. Scientists of any religious or other belief system need not believe in naturalism to practice science. They accept methodological naturalism and the framework within which they do interpret and report their scientific work. Oops. So Christian theists can and do practice science within methodological naturalism, knowing that any action of a theistic God will be a unique event so it's outside the realm of science. And they may, hold, they may well hold other reservations about science. But within this idea of methodological naturalism, as far as scientific studies are concerned, God does nothing. But the important thing, as Boyle pointed out 300 years ago, is that it also means that nature does nothing. Because people were saying nature does this, nature does that, and Boyle pointed out, you've just got to substitute God there with a different name. So science, 
likes to believe that it's a closed off little world with no interference with outside, from outside, just doing its own work in a very careful way. And it is a subset of human knowledge and scientistic people don't like you saying science is off centre in human knowledge. There's a vast amount we know outside of science and most people go through their lives with no contact with science or study of it or anything like it. And this human knowledge is within what we know is a greater reality and you'll see that both the border around human knowledge and reality are dotted because we don't know what their boundaries are. We don't know where the centre of reality is, nor, we do, nor do we know the outer limits. <clears throat> so scientism, which is short for scientific empiricism, and the empiricism tells you that the people who believe in this, such as Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss, want to make it the control belief over everything. <coughs> it's the belief that only scientific methods can produce knowledge and that only scientific knowledge is genuine. It's also the philosophical belief that no ideas outside scientific ones can be true, nor can they be shown to be true. These believers, as you no doubt know, Propose science as the opponent of religion, even as the disprover of God, religion and metaphysics, without realising that they are doing philosophy, not science. It's become a totalising belief system. It was methodological naturalism for just doing this work, but what these people are pushing with this idea of scientism is a totalising belief system over all of reality. So there's the diagram for them. Science, naturalism is the centre of human knowledge and has no boundary. There's a bit of human knowledge outside that but we'll get that under control, don't you worry about that. And it will expand out to know the rest of reality and there is a solid boundary around reality because if it doesn't fit within science, it doesn't exist. Quite a different belief system. <coughs> Those who believe in scientism may admit such ideas as morality, value, psychology, theology, religion, telos, purpose, but they try to force them into the demands of methodological naturalism or science, forcing morality and everything to be seen within naturalism. Where the big problem is you can't observe the rightness or wrongness of an action. It is cultural and ethical. Ethics, justice, responsibility require the idea of right and wrong. Where do they get these within naturalism? And scientism is self-refuting. It falsifies itself because if it is a statement of philosophy about knowledge and science, it is not a statement of science itself. And also, scientism argues in a circle. It says that naturalism is the philosophical basis of science and that science produces, proves the truth of naturalism its own philosophical base. Science can provide no absolute proof <clears throat> because it's ultimately calibrated against our sensory system. <clears throat> absolute proof is only available in logic and mathematics. Everything else is contingent. So reasonable proof is available in science and much in science is robust but short of absolute proof. It's interpreted by our reasoning processes and beliefs and we can't stand outside ourselves to see how good they are. Science assumes, for instance, but cannot prove that everything is uniform across all space and time. But it's near enough for our purposes. It's just not absolute. Science is amoral. Oh dear. 
Like all human inventions, science can be used for good or for bad and even for evil. And those motives, like all motives, come from outside science itself. Motives, values and ethics. Basic things such as honesty, as in reporting all your results, not just those that suit your hypothesis, come from outside science. But the problem is, in our postmodern society, how do you define ethical limits on science when postmodernist society has no agreed meta-ethic, no agreed overarching ethical system for the whole of society to define any such boundaries? I've been through that in bioethics research clinics. And I've got put on, when I was working in the emergency department, I got put on quite a few bioethics research committees and I kept saying, I found ethics the most boring part of philosophy. And they said, but you're the only person with a medical degree and a philosophy degree, so you have to go. So I learned all about committees and meetings and committee personalities and all the rest of it. Uh, and from my experience in biomedical research, ethics committees, scientists don't always understand there being any ethical limits on what they want to do or what they're allowed to do. And don't understand why they should submit their research proposal on what they want to do to human beings to outside checks. Nor do they always stick to the ethics to which they normally nominally subscribe, and they've been known to pinch their PhD students' work. And at least three Nobel Prizes that I know of have been awarded to people who pinched their PhD students' ideas. The problem with science and its fall from favour is its ultimate success. The bomb was the first thing designed from the formulae up by pure science. And after the war, we had MAD. Remember MAD? Mutually assured destruction. By the year of student rebellions in 1968, the Russians and the Americans had enough nuclear arsenal to destroy all life on Earth seven times over. By the end of the Cold War, they had enough to destroy all life on Earth 20 times over. So the reaction was, if that's the biggest and best you can do, we don't respect you. And so you get alternate medicine and all sorts of anti-science attitudes developing since then. And scientists just don't seem to understand that it's their ultimate success which has led to their downgrading of their status. <clears throat> laws of nature, laws of science, and philosophers argue about the difference, so we won't even go there. That at least much of what happens on Earth and in the heavens is predictable led to the idea of uniformity of action within the universe. The ancient Greeks worked all of this out. In the 17th century in England, they developed the idea that there are laws of nature, and it became popular when Newton's formula described the behaviour of falling apples on Earth and of planets in the heavens. So was born the idea of universal laws of nature which described the operations of many things around the universe. Back to Carl Sagan again. We live in an in-between universe where things change but according to patterns, rules or as we call them, laws of nature. And so it becomes possible to figure things out. We can do science and with it, improve our lives. David Bohm, who was a radical anti Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics physicist, said, modern physicists assume that the forces of nature are the essence of reality. But why are the forces of nature there? The forces of nature are then taken as the essence. The atoms weren't the essence. Why should these forces be? Uh, so, back in the dim, dark past, people had an explanation for things. You've got to have an explanation. It was the great god Thor who banged his stuff around in the kitchen and caused thunder and everything else that happened. Well, no one ever saw Thor, only his effects. No one knew how Thor did what he did. 
No one knew where it all came from. We're past all of that now. We've got this wonderful belief system in laws of nature, so much more sophisticated. Um, no one ever sees the law of nature, only its effects. No one knows how a law of nature does what it does. No one knows where the laws of nature come from. Haven't we made wonderful progress? Is the law of nature anything more than a mental abstraction from observed regularities? It'll describe and explain why the orbit of a planet is that shape and size and speed, but it can't explain why there's a planet and an orbit at all, or what the forces are. Hawking again. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? Stephen Hawking raised this question, but could not answer it. So, I got a bit disjointed here, and I'll see, yes. Science provides a description of the mechanics of planetary motion, but cannot say ultimately why or how there are planets, nor why there are laws of nature, nor what a law of nature is, nor how a law of nature works. Newton pointed this out after all the over-enthusiastic reactions after his publication of Pincripia in 1687, and he said to them, his over-enthusiastic followers, look, just because we've got a formula, F equals G, M1, M2 over D squared, this tells you how to predict how things behave under the influence of whatever gravity is. It doesn't tell us what gravity is, it doesn't tell us how gravity works. Oh, we'll change to emergent properties and there's a big problem of emergence and emergent properties and there are pages and pages and volumes and books and everything by philosophers on the subject. Because philosophers love going berserk over a problem and proving that it's got a thousand different aspects to this problem. So I had to go to a scientist to get a definition of emergent properties. Many phenomena in nature are emergent. <clears throat> they exhibit properties that cannot be predicted or understood simply by examining the system's parts. And the best example of this is how does mind emerge in the development of a person, in the development of nature and everything else? It seems to be something that you could not have predicted when you look at the basic chemistry and anatomy of brains and such like. What's this sense of perception? Um, now, I have a bit of an interest in that with my medical background and with my philosophy background and with having had a couple of strokes. So, um, but the problem is it's a huge subject, so it may be a good talk for it sometime in the future. What is mind? What is subjective experience? Um, it does, our brain doesn't function like a camera, for instance. It's not that it makes a picture there behind the lens. We actually look out in front of our lens and we see this room and I see you people. What makes it reverse like that into seeing outwards past the lens? Where and how is this experienced? So that's another time. <clears throat> Next subject, biogenesis, origin of life. How do all these chemical bits come together with all their non-functioning, non-living bits to make a living replicating cell? That's an emergent property of, of life. You can't have biology or natural selection until you have a functioning replicating cell. Before that is just normal chemistry, not molecular biology. Belief in the spontaneous generation of life was common at the time of Charles Darwin because everyone could see that there were all these bugs and ugly bits that grew on a dead body. So they just spontaneously arose. Then Louis Pasteur, later in the 19th century, showed that pasteurising of food, killing all life in it, 
prevented or delayed this decay process and prevented the disease spread. In particular, it stopped pasteurising milk, stopped the transmission of tuberculosis from cows to humans. And so he set up an experiment. He pasteurised a broth, a broth, kept it from contamination, and that system that he set up is still running in Paris. It shows no signs of the development of any life forms yet. By 1953, it was still thought that cells were just organised blobs of soup, organic soup. 1953, Nature magazine published the Miller-Urey experiment that simple organic molecules could be amino acids, could be a few of them, could be produced in what was thought to be the primeval conditions of the development of simple life forms. This was greeted with great jubilation as proof that the chemical chemistry of life could arise spontaneously. But later in that same year, in the same na magazine Nature, Watson and Crick showed the first photos of the DNA molecule, thus opening a great gulf between simple organic molecules and replicating life forms. And all that we have learnt of molecular biology since then has simply opened this gap enormously. A huge complication. So, this diagram. We've got normal chemistry claimed to be going on to produce life, a living molecule, which is biology and a living organism. What I'm adding to this argument is the next bit, at death. When a person or an animal or whatever dies, biological chemistry, the chemistry of life, breaks down. Normal chemistry takes over and everything disintegrates. There's something strangely different in that section there. Scientists don't want anything to do with vitalism, but when you look at the normal chemistry on each side of this and what they do... So I invented my dead elephant problem. An elephant dies in a tropical swamp. There you have a tonne of all the right chemicals in the same place at the same time, all swirling around. But it all just decays once life ceases, whatever life is. There are gods of the gaps in biogenesis. Time, chance, blind faith and hope. Some people want to talk about selection of the molecules in that earlier stage, but you can't have selection until you've got a functioning replicating cell. It is just ordinary chemistry that is supposed to get all the molecules together to make a living replicating cell. And then politics and ideologies, global warming. This is the first secular apocalyptic and it's been attracting all the same sorts of personalities and all the same sort of behaviours as all the previous religious apocalyptics. And it's going to be interesting to see if it doesn't happen, whether all this apocalyptic fervour is going to break up into all the mess that the religious apocalyptics broke up into when their predictions didn't come true. Now, I wrote this section before the recent amazing event of international ideological child abuse. Notice that what I'm saying in this section, I'm not saying anything for or against or sceptical of global warming. All I'm talking about in this section is the interference of the global warming people on science. They claim the science of global warming is settled. Really? It's a prediction. Carl Sagan's giant reputation in astronomy was earned because only he accurately predicted the temperature on the surface of the Venus. And the important thing was he got it right for all the right reasons. So on predicting planetary temperatures and atmospheres and everything, he has a score of one and everyone else has a score of zero. 
So scientific prediction is not settled even when the result comes in, even if it comes in as predicted, because then the real scientist's job is to show that it happened because of what that scientist predicted and not because of confounding variables and previous, uh, previously <coughs> unknown factors. So the prediction, the science of a prediction is never settled even when what you predict comes true. So to say that the science of global warming is settled could not be said by a scientist functioning as a scientist. Many, there have been quite a few scientists who complain about all this global warming scenario. And I'm going to quote one, Dr Judith Curry, former chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Tech, who resigned from her position three Januarys ago. She was formerly chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. She said, a deciding factor in my resignation was that I no longer knew what to say to students and postdocs regarding how to navigate the craziness in the field of climate science. That was her emphasis, craziness. She said, research and other professional activities are professionally rewarded only if they are channeled in certain directions approved by the politicised academic establishment. That's my emphasis. Funding, ease of getting your papers published, getting hired in prestigious positions, appointments to prestigious committees or boards and professional negotiation. Then comes an amazing statement. <coughs> it often becomes a battle between scientific integrity versus career suicide. This is in climate science. So, science is not walled off from outside influence. Funding, publication, jobs, appointments all interfere with what is going on there. And this belief in global warming is exerting a far greater control and distortion over the practice of science than any religion has ever done. Remember my talk on Galileo where I showed that he was in trouble because he barged into scriptural interpretation without having the scientific evidence he needed to do it. Cardinal Bellarmine said, you provide the scientific evidence, we will get the doctors of the church to reinterpret scripture. So he actually got into trouble for reinterpreting scripture, which he wasn't supposed to do after the Reformation, and not providing the scientific evidence, which didn't come until 1832 with the observation of parallax of stars, as I said. So when scientists ceased being independently wealthy people and they became employees of institutions, as I mentioned way back from 1833 when the word scientist was invented, then funding became a powerful manipulative tool and businesses and ideologues have used this financial power, as have politicians, to manipulate scientists, if not science itself. So science is not walled off from influences from the surrounding culture. And there have been scientists who've said this. Karl Popper said, since scientists get subsidies for the work, science isn't exactly what it should be. This is unavoidable. There is a certain corruption, unfortunately, but I don't talk about that. I don't talk about that, but I've just said it. Francis Crick of Watson and Crick fame gloated recently that he was in a perfect position to promote consciousness as a scientific problem. I don't have to get grants. I'm not subject to outside influence. And in various of my interactions with science and the biomedical world and all of this, I've heard these things being discussed. What is money being given for this year? How can we make our project appear to fit within that code to get the money? Science and God. It's a question in philosophy and theology, not in science, because science can say nothing about whether there is a God or not, nor about what this God may have done in creation or in the operation of the universe. Because science is a method of study of the operation of an already regularly functioning universe or creation that is coherent and predictable. 
Scientists may say things about origins from their own belief systems, but again, science itself cannot speak. Thomas Nagel has stirred up all sorts of people lately, including evolutionists as an atheist, but he said, it isn't that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. Hawking and Mladenov. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Lawrence Krauss. Nothing plus the laws of nature produce the universe that we have. Oops. What sort of nothing somewhere, somehow, somewhen has the laws of nature in it? How can you have a law of nature before there is a nature? The laws of nature from our perspective only describe how things happen. These philosophising scientists have made the laws of nature into creative forces or agents. This is speculative scientific origins myth-making. So, conclusion. Science can tell us a huge and increasing amount about how the universe operates. But it cannot, as science, tell us anything about how the universe came about, nor why the universe behaves as it does, nor about the meaning, value or purpose of the universe, nor of our own lives, nor how we should live. Um, your, your, the question you gave was uh, uh, quite um, uh, or sceptical or um, like, it's, uh, do, you, do you actually kind of see, uh, have a, a positive side for the view of science? Because uh, um, in a sense it came across as a bit negative. <coughs> Oh, as I said at the end, it produced, has produced an enormous amount of information about how things in the universe operate and it's expanded at an enormous rate and I'm grateful for all the scientific advances in medicine since I graduated mm -hmm. because I've needed them. Mm -hmm. um, but in a lot of the arguments about it with Dawkins and Krauss and the others, they make such blank overstatements that I wanted to say, look, they can't get away with that. Mm. There are all sorts of problems along the way and there are all sorts of limitations on what science can tell us. <coughs> and it's all subject to our interpretations and our uses and our... Well, that's not a form mm. of science itself, isn't it? It's a misuse no, that's of a science. human problem. Yes, it's a misuse of science. And science is a human activity. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 uh, like I, I uh, do research at the uni and uh, I had an aha experience a few months ago because uh, we were having, uh, I spoke briefly to some of the people, uh, we were having problems measuring the speed of sound between a drone and microphones on the ground. So I went to my supervisor and said, can I actually perform some calibration tests? Because we'd actually shown that we had GPS to give the position of the, uh, the drone, and it was assumed that the it was reporting the centre of the drone, and so I went and uh, did some experiments with another one guy. We whacked the stake in the ground, we put the UAV on top, and we rotated the UAV, and then uh, measured the uh, position that was reported. And if it was the centre, it should have actually stayed in the same spot. But it didn't. It went round in a circle. So. So, oh, that's interesting. And so we worked out which direction it pointed. So we then actually did some tilt tests. We tilted the thing forward, tilted it back, rolled it right, rolled it left, and saw what happened to the recorded position. And what we actually found out was um, that it had two antennas on it that were mounted longitudinally along that, and it ended up they were 32 centimetres apart. And so the, which explained, and we actually worked out that it was actually reporting the location of one of those RTK antennas. So we did this by uh, empirical tests, and that made all the difference. 
uh, to our, our results, but it was a real aha moment, it's a breakthrough. And that, so, uh, I, you know, that kind of reinforced, in my mind, the value of doing empirical tests. Oh, yes, yes. Mm. But the, the talk wasn't entitled The Achievements of Science. Mm. It was the philosophy and limits of science mm. and the limits that people can claim for it. Yeah. That's what I was talking about. You said, yeah, but you said you, you can't prove anything, but uh, gee, that You can't came prove up. anything absolutely. Yeah. But you can prove it well enough for our purposes. Yeah, I believe, I know where that, yeah. that, that GPS location is now. And it was, uh, yeah, I know. And the problem is that that's a philosopher's sense of absolute proof. Mm. It was good enough for me. That in. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, it's good enough for our purposes in all that we do. Yeah. But the, the caution uh, in all that is like, as Thomas Kuhn pointed out, is that you know, people have this paradigm that they work under. And so all the, the paradigm is like an interpretive grid, uh, so a, a framework for, for resolving problems. And in many cases, um, all the data comes in and you can explain it in that paradigm. And then eventually some data comes in that you can't explain. <laughs> and then the more data comes in that you can't explain. And then people think, well, this paradigm isn't working now, yep. so we've got to start replacing it with something else. And then eventually the new paradigm comes in which explains what we explained before plus all the new data. And so, in that way, that, that what, what, we're, what we're in now, or at any point in history, is a paradigm that has to explain all the data at the moment. And as you get more data, it may, that may not, the paradigm may not work, it may, it may not work. Mm. So it's a best approximation of yeah. what we've got at the moment. This becomes most, a, most scientists aren't bothered about the paradigm if they know anything about it at all. Yeah, They've got right. an enthusiasm well, for doing that. one project and they, they get stuck work. into that. And they don't bother with all the rest of this talk. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I could have quite, I quoted three scientists' criticisms <clears throat> of philosophy, but there are a lot more. <clears throat> you also made the distinction between, say, uh, cosmology and empirical science. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, the like the empirical science is where you can do a repeated <coughs> test. Yes. And, and um, is science. Yes. And when you're in astronomy, you can uh, look at the universe mm. and improve all your observations and all that sort of thing, but you can't actually go out and perform an experiment on the star, can you? And you can't perform an experiment on the universe. We've only got one. No. And it doesn't control very yeah. well in a laboratory. <laughs> all right. But, but uh, that doesn't really mean that we should um, be kind of dismissive of um, cosmology. It's still a, a valid form no, no, of knowledge. It, it yeah. just means we should be careful about the claims yes. of things that are not subject to repeatable tests. Yeah. yeah. John, John Hartnett made the same point, I think, in his talks. Mm. You know, there's only one universe and you can't experiment with it, mm. so a lot of cosmology yeah. is. Yeah. But it's still a valid field of study. Yeah, yes. Yes. You just oh, have yes. to kind of wave the flag right, here yeah. are the, uh, my assumptions and my limits. Yeah, yeah. 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 My question is sort of related to it is that um, do you believe that the universe is constant or changing? Because that's a, um, that relates to... Everything that I see changes all the time and I, I'm not worried too much about what's out there. Yeah, but I mean... I'm, I'm, I'm not on the around with that in the And on the Earth as well. The, the things are irreversible. I'm not around with that not, in, not, not, not when irreversible. I was doing philosophy, when we had Graham Nerdick who got his professorship in philosophy on space and time. Yeah. And we had Paul Davies as the professor of physics there at the same that time. Mm. But the trouble is, like all the medical stuff, a lot of that thinking process got chewed up by the stroke. So I just keep it down to yeah. what I can see doing now. Yeah, I'm there are. talking about entropy and the, the uh, things that change that are driven <coughs> by the fact you can't put the genie back in the bottle after you've No, it. Yeah. no. And that's... So that I'm, I'm, what I'm really trying to say is a lot of that is around cosmology as well, where you're inferring that the stars are getting away from you by, sh by, by shifts and things like that, so of the, of the light. So is that science or is that not science? To infer Can you do controlled repeatable from tests on it? I'm sorry? Can you do controlled repeatable tests on it? Yes, you can. You can. On what, yes. sorry? You can do repeatable tests in the sense that... Um, um, the, the shifts aren't going in one, aren't going in the opposite direction. 
Is you, you can actually prove that you know the light changes if it's uh, the, the, the wave should occurs if it's going away from you or for you. You can do experiments to show that, and then you can show that the mm. light is only moving away from you. So therefore, the universe is expanding. Well, yeah, not not quite because there's some some di disagreement over whether those shifts are dot like shifts or whether it's actually as a cause of the universe itself expanding. So, is it moving away? In the sense, because the universe is expanding, or is it because the things are physically moving away? So there's some there's some disagreement about that. And secondly, you've got um, things that are very near to each other or physically connected, showing very different shifts. And so, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we can't explain those. So, so this is where we get down to the, the Kuhnian view that yes, we can explain the data, but there's some data we can't explain. Well, actually, I'll, I've used a bad example. Um, there was a time, I'm a mechanical engineer, so um, thermodynamics and stuff like that. It was a realisation that you can't create a perpetual motion machine. Yeah. Okay. That is the irreversibility I'm talking about. Yeah. But it, it shows itself up in chemical reactions in the universe. Everything is sort of going to a uniform state of nothingness at the moment, which appears to be a law of nature or whatever. So that's what I mean. Do you believe that the, uh, that the universe is constant or are we going to, you know, um, to sort of nothingness, you know. Is, is, is that a, is that a <coughs> of science or is that a theory or is it a, um, it's based on certain facts you discover and can measure. It's, um, it's they the, predict things out of it. It's the interpretation of observations that are made. Yes but you can't do any controlled experiment on the thing producing those observations. How do you mean by that, sorry? Um. <coughs> That's just a general comment about uh, cosmology, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, well, cosmology yeah. was the example where it's a, mm. it's a case in point. Yeah. Other scientists say, no, it is not science. That's what I was, why I was quoting them there. Yeah, yeah no, I realise that, yeah. I, I had several others opinion. who were saying that same sort of thing. No, These are interesting, interesting observations. Yeah. They draw interesting conclusions. They compare results, but they cannot do any controlled, repeatable tests on the cosmos. Yeah. It just depends on how you define science. So that's yeah. what, that's what I'm and that's why I'm get saying out. I'm running yeah. a very tight definition to cut out all sorts of parascientific and pseudoscientific theories, which is behind keeping to that tight definition. And there are a number of scientists who agree with that. Mm. Yeah, because the um from a strict science has made progress when it's been applied in engineering. You know, we can build things, create things, things that really work and improve lives. And so there's that kudos, I think you were talking about that sort of um, status that sort of catch the science. And so now the, the definition of science gets expanded. People want to say, oh, I'm a scientific. Yeah, oh, yes. So to try yes. and get that, take that, uh, that, that status. They want the kudos of the title. I was thinking about um, economics. See, would you describe economics as being uh, science because um, you know you can you can um, uh, have theories that you could uh, possibly uh, test, but then the problem with economics is it involves human beings and human beings don't always act the same way or rationally or anything. So, mm. but it, how can an economist do an experiment on Australia's economy? Yeah, they can't they do can't a controlled, really. repeatable no, test. No, that's right. Yeah, it's an observational yeah. study. That's right. It, it's it's quite legitimate in its area. Yeah, but, but you, what what you can do is you can make a prediction. With yeah, it. that's right. You make a prediction, and then it either comes true or it don't. Yeah, but you can't test <coughs> that under the, any <coughs> different circumstances. No, yeah, there's, there's no. so many different variables that. Yeah, yeah. Can't, sometimes yeah. it might work, but sometimes it won't. Yeah, mm. now it's just about where all the attention is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yes, Dennis? Um, assuming you believe that the Bible is the word of God, as I do, you know, it's in all scriptures and stuff. No, no, no. Jesus is the word of God. Mm -hmm. The Bible is a book about the word of God. Well, it does also say that all scripture is inspired by God, so I believe That's it's... referring to the Old Testament. Well, no, yes, so it let does let also let say... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 It does so say... That uh, all the scriptures of Bible are in, and, and that, um, that Paul's writings are difficult to understand, as is other scripture. So I would argue that all the New Testament is scripture as well. Um, anyway, assuming you agree with that, which you probably don't, um, 
and that the world was created in six literal days, which I believe is very clear the way it's worded, I believe. Um, and with your studies in this, this sort of area for years, have you come up with any sort of theory about how God could have created the universe and how it, um, how it sort of functioned, how all the miracles of the Bible could have been done? I think we get into a lot of trouble when we try to tell God how or why he does anything. Um, I grew up in a Baptist mission to the Aborigines. And that gave me a very tribal view of all the writings in the Old Testament. And then I step into white culture with all its scientific post-enlightenment attitudes, all of this stuff. And I think the tribal Aborigines had better interpretations. <laughs> you, you tell that story of creation, for instance, to the Aborigines, and what they draw from it is the two things that anybody of any intellectual or educational standard <coughs> wants to know who and why. God made it all to make it home for us and to make us for relationships with him, him and each other. Now, if you ask the Aborigines, when did God do it? Mm, back in the dream time. How did God do it? Well, they look as though, at you as though you've gone mad. Only God knows. God never tells us how he does anything. And we get into trouble. See, Aristotelian philosophy had substances and essences for everything. Well, the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation is that Aristotelian doctrine of substance being imposed on God. And we all do that all the time, trying to tell God how and why he does things. And I think, yeah, it's all on such a scale the details and the actions are beyond us. So I'm sitting there with the Aborigines saying, yeah, who cares? The um, important thing is who and why. What, um, you actually made some uh, comments on the laws of what are the laws of nature. Um, and um, uh, you could also you could talk about laws of physics. Mm -hmm. So a, a question I've asked before is what are the laws of the physics? Are they just the properties of the physical world or do they actually exist independently in some platonic realm? <laughs> um, like, I, yeah, are they outside the universe and, um, or are they just properties of the universe? God is on such a scale that all mechanisms and all time scales are open to him. We don't know what other laws of nature or things he could have used or what other materials he could have made. And we've just got this one sample and we don't know how it works. Um, it's all on such a scale that I think, I look at these philosophy and theology sites that I get to read and I think, you really are struggling. What's the point? And as I get older, what's the point is my attitude to a lot of these intense debates about small things. Um, I just want to come in with a different angle, and that is for, as someone who's close to 50, right, and I work in a secular environment, I'm confronted by a very science-based science environment where the arguments for an old earth and evolution model is there. And from a Christian point of view, someone who's trying to be an, an apologist and present the gospel, if I come in um, at them as a, uh, from a, what's something that might have been successful 50, 50 years ago, which was the assumption that God did exist, all right, I get nowhere because a lot of them don't believe God exists. What I'm trying to say is that science, I think, actually does point to God. We made a, we made a <coughs> inference that you thought that science came up point to, to God. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Now, there were in the 1970s, you can point out if I'm wrong, Kevin, but um, I've got two space-time theorems here that pretty much turned um, the world on its head. Um, here are they. Um, if mass exists and general relativity 
you know, reliably predict cosmic dynamics, then space and time must be created, implying a causal agent who transcends space and time. Now, that was written by Hawking, Ellis <coughs> and Penrose. And then there was another one. Any universe that expands on average has a beginning, implying a causal agent outside space and time that creates space and time, matter and energy. That was Bourdais, Vilenkin and Guth. Now, Bourdais and Vilenkin were so disturbed by their findings, they spent the next 10 years trying to come up with an alternative to that, okay? And then they found themselves saying um, that regardless of the energy conditions or what type of inflation event the universe experienced at the beginning, <coughs> Vilenkin wrote in a subsequent book, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, of all the religious texts, the Bible points to a cosmic beginning, okay? And when you present that to people, they go, okay, what else does it say? So my theory is that you can use nature, science, to point to the book, of, to the Bible, because mm. it's in there. So I think dismissing it completely is, from an apologist's point of view, is, for me, in my age that I'm going to be living in, is, is completely inappropriate, okay? It might have worked in your decade, but not in mine. Okay, I'm, I'm, it's just, I find it disappointing because I think, you know, if something's not working, we've got to figure out why it's not working and try and find another way because God, the God that I serve, doesn't just sit back and let it happen. He, he, he <coughs> works a way to reach people. Yeah. yeah. He, he, for example, if you're going to send missionaries to a, another country, you spend time thinking about the culture. What are their practices? How can I present the gospel to them? Mm -hmm. Now, as Christians, we have to look at the environment that we're growing up in or that we're living in and say, how can we present the gospel to a world that is drowning in science? Okay. And we can, you can sit back and say, oh, yes, it's, you know, it's all well and good or whatever, but that's because we already know the truth, you know. <laughs> Regardless of whether you have an old earth or young earth position, all right, it doesn't matter. That's, not, that's irrelevant for us because we're saved, okay. But to someone who's sitting and saying, I will not enter a church or even entertain the idea of God because I... Believe that the, the Earth is that the universe is thirteen point seven five billion years old. How are you going to reach them? Okay, and this is the problem. We have to sit down and put it all on the table and look at it and say, let's take a step back and try and take the emotion out of it and say, what's what's the best fit? How can we reach them? Mm -hmm. Because the last commandment Christ gave us was to go out and preach the gospel, and we've all got to personally take that seriously. Uh, and um, Anyway, so I think what you're much. saying is that we should be using science as a tool to... We should. Uh, we argue. should. And, and That's not a scientific argument. So, so you, you, yeah. You so, I, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm, yeah, well, yeah. not going to get into the, whether yeah. it's a philosophical... I'm talking about when the rubber hits the road and you're having a chat with a friend, yeah. a colleague, who says, I'm an atheist because I believe that the, in evolution. And I could say, well, actually, I do believe that the, that, that, um, the universe is 13.75 13, 13 uh, years old as well. I believe that Genesis actually um, presents that as well. Now, my friend here that I've ever met, but he believes that the Earth is um, 6,000 years old and I believed that for 40 years, okay? And then I got to the point where I thought, hey, I'm not getting anywhere with my evangelism skills. I'm trying to get to these people and I'm not having any, I'm not getting any breaks. As soon as I changed my mental, my mental thought, I thought, okay, Lord, what, what should I do? Read some books on cosmology, cosmology and then get into the debates again. And guess what? I made some progress. So you can, we can sit on our little, you know, on our, on our laurels and just sort of enjoy life, or we can say, what are we trying to do as Christians? I think in the environments that we're living in, with our children and grandchildren, how are we going to present the gospel to them? Because they go out in the world and they get um, beaten up by people saying, you know, that you, know, you can't believe this because the, the, the universe is old. So 
So, yeah. so, but, but, but you're, you're absolutely thing. right. The, yeah. the, the thinking is, is wrong and the, the, um, the um, approach is, is you know, not the right one. But it's, it's not about, uh, from what you're saying, and, and I've seen some other things, um, it, it, it doesn't come about whether the, the earth, how old the earth is. That's, that's not the point. That's just a manifestation. Yeah. The, the real problem is that they're materialists. They don't believe in the supernatural. That's what it comes down to. No, Do you believe in the supernatural or don't you? Now, if you believe in, if you believe there's no God, if you believe that everything is just empirical science, and, and as he was talking about, God is just not on the page. That they, they, they think you're, you're talking past each other. Yeah. And that's the barrier you've got to break down. That's right. And I, I think you can use science to do yeah. that. And that, that space time. Do you believe in the supernatural that. or don't you? Yeah, but the because space. The, the account in Genesis is supernatural. Yes. You can't believe is. the account in Genesis if you don't believe in the supernatural. You're wasting your time. And I'm, and I'm saying yeah. that the space time theorems point to a, a being beyond space and time that brought the universe into, into existence. And so the God of the Bible is the one that is the closest to that. So that brings, you can say, supernaturally, they're faced with the fact that this is why they're grasping at nothing, you know, nothing <coughs> that might be created or the multiverse. Mm. These are all uh, metaphysical stuff. It's nothing mm. to do with science. Mm. So they're grasping at stuff. Who would have thought 50 years ago they'd even, even try and think like that? They're mm. thinking like that because they're desperate. No, they've been alive for 100 years. Yeah, yeah I know, but, <laughs> but in the public arena, they're talking about it. When before, they might just talked behind closed doors about it. So yeah. I, I, I'm just, I, want to, I suppose I'm just trying to say that we can think a bit differently and not be afraid of it, that's all. I mean, mm. yeah. But it's like the, uh, uh, whether you believe in the supernatural or not is not just arbitrary, a personal choice. Yeah. Right. Uh, you, um, if you um, believe in the supernatural, you should actually give a reason why other people should believe that too. And I think that's what Bronwyn was saying. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and, and so you don't just kind of write people off, oh, they don't believe in the supernatural, yeah. so why bother with them? I'll go to some. No, no, I wasn't saying that. I was yeah. saying that that's yeah. the problem you've got to solve. Yes, yes. And, uh, yeah. and uh, yeah, and uh, no, it's not a matter of that's, off. And that is the approach that Bronwyn And I think in the, the narrow, is, in the narrow sense of science that was, uh, was mentioned tonight, you can't prove that God exists. Yes, science will lead you to a point where yeah. you say there must, there is a beginning. Yeah, but you can't prove God beyond that. So, uh, when if I've ever done uh, street evangelism or something like that, I can take people through the philosophical arguments mm. to believe that there is a God. It's a completely different argument that no science is ever going to get you through to convert someone or get someone to believe. Because at that point, when you've proven the classical God that you mentioned, you can be a Hindu, you can be a, a Jew, a Muslim, yeah, yeah. or a Christian. Any of those are viable, reasonable options from that point. So, gospel proclamation then moves into more of a, a personal. Well, the thing about the the beginning of the universe, though, that dismisses Hinduism, not and all, not all. It not does because they believe in an eternal universe. Okay, not so all. I think don't believe in a god as such. Yeah, yeah. so, so it, it actually no wipes off god. Hinduism and. Um, and Hindu, Hinduism is quite varied. It's not. It's not one general religion. <coughs> different, and some of them have a created god, uh, single being. So. Yeah. But that's within space and time, not outside space and time. The, the Bible makes numerous references to God being outside space and time, creating space and time, not within it. So if you look at their texts, they talk about God's or God's creating within space and time. So that's what makes Christianity and the God of the, the Bible so exceptional. I'll say something. I think when we argue, though, is it's unprovable. Like you've said, you can't prove that there is a God, you can't prove there isn't. But in, in many ways, in atheists, it's the same. Yeah. As a Christian to me, you, you accept the unknown <coughs> one way or the other. Day. It's just one, one of the same thing. The atheist says, I accept things as they are. I don't know how they're formed. I'm just part of it. Mm. And, and somebody who believes in a God just accepts that there's a cause behind it. They're, they're, to me, they're, 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 the two concepts are very similar. Um, but um, So the argument to me about whether you're a Christian is not just to go back to what you just said, you go back to the words of Jesus. That's the only reason I'm a Christian. If you ask me to believe the Old Testament with my view, my modern view of the world, I would dismiss it. So I think you're wasting your time over the arguments of the beginning of the universe, whether it's 6,000 or, or 5 million years. It's more about um, 
the, the, the bigger bit outside the, the little bit of the science is the philosophical bit that gets you on, across the line. Of well, the title was The Philosophy and Limits of Science. Yes. And I was trying to point out that philosophy is done within a philosophical system. Yeah which is held by faith, which cannot be proved. Mm. And there are lots of That's limits right. on it. Exactly right. And the four horsemen of the apocalypse don't want to put any limits on science. Mm. That's why I'm saying there are Well, there are limits. limits on science. And in, in, in the end, God has to draw the person to them anyway, to God himself anyway. But, yeah, anyway. I, I, I use the approach, I, I guess, um, uh, I've just found to shape it to an extent and use this, you know, try and show that you, you can't live consistently with this materialistic view. How do, you, how do you explain the mind? How do you explain thought? How do you explain, um, uh, how do you explain you know, emotion? How do you explain love? Um, you, know, you can't explain these in science because these are value, virtue, ethical things. And so I'd use that to... Uh, to, to demonstrate that there's more to science than just the empirical, yeah. uh, more, more to knowledge, sorry, more to knowledge than just empirical science. Just That's why I had science yeah. as one yeah. subset of human so knowledge and holding out reality. that there are mm -hmm. all Half these other things in human knowledge mm -hmm. um, which are not part of science. Yeah. I mean, it is a very limited <laughs> yeah. mechanism of stu study which produces massive results. But within a very small area of life. Yes, yes. If you claim to oppose the beliefs of science, why do you use the same excuse mm -hmm. that it's not what you're talking about? I don't understand. Can you explain that a bit more? Earlier, you said that to get out of, of explaining the flaws, they just say it isn't what they're talking about. <coughs> you said the same thing for Grandad. That's a big that, problem in discussion. But what he, he said to oppose you was not what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. You can only cover a small area and really one line in a talk like this. And there are lots of things outside that could have been said, but I'm not talking about that, is my response to most of <coughs> Because I can only talk about one line, which was the philosophy and limits of science. And uh, I tried to stick to that. Yeah. In, well, I, I basically yeah. agree with you too. Yeah. Mm. I don't think anything you said um, is opposed to what you said, Brian. Yeah, really? No. Uh, you, you, what you explained, the philosophy and limits of science, yeah. it's all perfectly valid. Yeah. And I can fully appreciate you know, the need to evangelise mm. and uh, you've got to you have to endeavour to evangelise mm. the people of our mm. contemporary world, yeah. our contemporary society. I agree with that. Um, I don't necessarily agree. I don't think you can necessarily get very far um, even when you can show um, that science points to the need for a creator because like was said by somebody, you know, you, you don't know what kind of God you've got. You, you know, you just prove that there needs to be some supernatural, not necessarily the God who spoke through the Bible uh, at all. So I don't, I don't really see that the, the things you've said and the things that Leonard have said are actually opposed. This is the enormous effect of cutting telos and purpose out yeah. of science. That's the point I was making. Mm. That was a deliberate move by Francis Bacon. Yeah. And he's written out in most philosophy and science books because they don't think he did anything much. But he, set, he changed the <coughs> paradigm within which science was done from an Aristotelian system which had purpose in it to a purposeless Epicurean system. Mm. And you get into all sorts of nonsense talk in biology then, mm. trying to say that these living things have no purpose. Mm. We, as living things, have no purpose. Mm. That's the point I was making, that it is already excluded from science 400 years ago. Yeah. Well, but that's not... That's not I don't necessarily think that's a problem. Um, I think it was, was it, uh, what's his name? Not Thomas, uh, not Aquinas, uh, Sigma Theologica, what's his name? 
my mind's gone blank. The guys worked in the theology. I have that all the time. <laughs> I can't remember now. Um, he brought Aristotelianism into the into theology. The 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 no. Sorry, that's a final. Okay. <clears throat> Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, it was Thomas Aquinas. Sorry, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking I'm getting Augustine and Aquinas. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Thomas Aquinas. When, so, the, when the Big Bang was first proposed, Nature magazine was the prime magazine of science, which those two articles came from. But when the Big Bang theory was first proposed, Nature produced an editorial saying, this is nonsense because that means there was a starting point. Mm. They wanted to dismiss it, yeah. They dismissed it mm. in yeah. the editorial at yeah. the beginning. And the other point I'm going to make about time and so on was that I thought Augustine was the first that said tense time, time which has past, present and future tense, was made with creation and exists only within creation. But I found he was quoting somebody from a couple of hundred years earlier who was quoting a Jewish rabbi studying the scriptures from about 200 years before Christ. So this has been built into the whole interpretation that Tense time, which has past, present and future tense, only exists within creation and God is in some sort of different sense of time which we call eternity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we cannot comprehend. We yeah. can't even explain the flow of time. And the, yeah. Yeah. Um, Augustine wrote, when I did the philosophy of space and time, Augustine's article on the flow of time is still the standard article, which he produced by asking three questions. Where does tomorrow come from? Where has yesterday gone? And how long is the present moment? Mm -hmm. And when you go through his writing on that, you feel like your brain's been put through a ringer <laughs> trying to sort all that out. And he said, this is our tense time, which only exists within creation. Mm -hmm. God is in something different. Mm -hmm. Who said that? Was this Augustine? Was it? Augustine, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as I say, it is still the classic article on the flow of time. Yeah. 1,600 yeah, years later. Yeah. On the subjection of uh, teleology and purpose, um, like it may, I think it might be true that science is not capable of uh, testing for purpose. It's just that the problem is if, if because science is incapable of making a judgment on it, uh, then denying that purpose exists is uh, not being... <coughs> is going beyond the realms of science. That's why I was quieting the scientists and yeah. saying they are philosophizing. Yes. Yeah, they're not That's, doing science. That, I was going to make the same point. That, yeah, That's the, right. the, uh, Bacon was, was right, I think, to exclude purpose because the, the scientific method can't, can't measure that. It doesn't no. have the tools to do it. It's like if you get a $10 note and, you can, and science, you can do a scientific analysis of it and it'll tell you everything about the polymers, the plastic, the printing, the colour, the size, demand, you can tell all, all about that thing. But you can't tell them, you can't scientifically demonstrate that it's worth $10. Mm. And, and well, the value of $10 will depend on the day because the exchange rate right. goes up. That's right, scientific so, analysis of a lawyer, yeah, uh, yeah. an oil painting. So, so yeah, exactly, you can't, so you can, you can't look at, yeah, you can't appreciate the value or the virtue of a, mm. of a painting or whatever. So mm. I, I think that's, that's right, science just doesn't have the tools. It's like getting a ruler and trying to, Say or weigh weigh the, the 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 weight of that chair with a ruler. It's just it's a category mm. error. Mm. But this was the move with scientism to say that that methodological naturalism which we use when we're doing and reporting science, when that becomes a belief about the whole of life, universe, yeah. and everything, then you've made a massive philosophical move, not a scientific move. Mm. Yeah, so you're saying because science can't deal with it, therefore it's not true. Yeah. <laughs> That's the mistake. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Or you pretend that science can deal with it. Yeah. yeah. But were the scientists actually chasing God who, at that time, though, even back in medieval times, you were a philosopher and a scientist, mm. Mm. and you were just basically trying to find out the unknown. <coughs> Boyle and Newton and all the others thought they exploring were showing the wonders of God's creation. Yeah. Look how cleverly he made it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as we've split the atom further and further, we got we find more and more in the infinite how how infinite the smallness is. So, oh. um, so, but that's what I'm trying to what I'm really trying to say is you shouldn't separate necessarily the science from the philosophy, and mm -hmm. you made that point. Mm -hmm. so, the, they the all previously, previously it's about finding about the unknown, 
the method, the scientific method is different than the science. That's, that's what struck me as you were talking. All of these, my between, point is that yeah. all of these atheist apologists step outside science into philosophy to make their pronouncements. That's why the title, The Limits of Science. They're the, outside science when they talk like that. But, but do they have a right to step outside of that? Oh, yes, they have the yeah. right. Yeah. But not but science. Don't, that's science. Science. Don't, and that's no, no, don't not take not. the yeah. reputation of science with yeah. it. Don't yeah, take the yeah. status they're of... They're dragging it right. down just as certain... Yeah. Yeah. Just because they're speaking as a scientist... Make you flinch as well. Just because it's a scientist speaking doesn't mean he's talking science. Exactly. He mightn't even know when he's talking philosophy, and most of them don't know. That's right. So the same applies when a Christian talks, or so-called Christian can talk. You know, we, we all have different views of uh, our religion, as you say, mm. different paradigms we operate on. So it can make us flinch when somebody else um, is <coughs> expressing views that we don't believe mm. as, mm. as Christians or whatever. Mm. So it, it's, it's both. Like, to me, it's just life. It's, oh, yes. Yeah. yes. The creation ministries people in Queensland, and there's a few others, <coughs> but they all... You know, PhD scientists who totally believe the Bible is true and believe in the six day creation, obviously, would come out with this quarterly magazine called Creation, which you probably see. Um, they approach it as if, well, okay, what's the Bible say about everything? And it says that this creation is really to do with God wanting to have uh, as many believers as He can sort of muster who are prepared to share the universe, uh, the, share the eternities with Him. Uh, and be you know be obedient to, to his realm, uh, and that everything in this creation is designed in some way related to that purpose. And it's amazing how much good stuff we've got. And the point I'm making is that if you look at it from that point of view, everything does make sense. Hmm. <coughs> The church was split. <laughs> Christians are split in this issue, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I think um, Leonard was trying to talk in more general terms mm -hmm. that didn't well, yeah, that applied to both. Growing up with the Aborigines and seeing the Old Testament and all that stuff taught there gives me such a different perspective that I look at all this rabid knocking it down and everything, and I think that's an Enlightenment rationalist way of interpreting Scripture. That's a corruption since the 17th century in the way we look at scripture compared with the way the Aborigines took it all. Mm. Oh, yeah, and we, we don't live in Aboriginal society, you know. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, that's fine. We, but we don't live in that society. Right. And, no, but uh, nor do we want it either, really. Right. Nobody wants to live in the way that Aboriginals lived before white man came to the country. D -d Does anyone? No. Um, hunting and um, we can learn a lot. I no, think I'm not saying we can learn a lot from no, no, that, I've got I, that green, came out I've got as extremely racist respect for them. and really, really bad for the way you see no, it. No, I don't think so. That's I think it did actually. No. Um, it, there was an element of um, superiority in your statement. No, was it? No, no there is. There was. No, 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 no. I think no, you need to rethink the phrase what you just said. It's a cultural matter, not a phrase. I think the evidence is really bad. They have an ancient view of looking at and that uh, our perspective is different from the environment which was written. Yeah, yeah but my yeah. problem with the way we go about everything now is that we don't know enough history to realise that this whole idea of what is literal and what is true and everything else comes from the Enlightenment and is not the previous history of the church. And oh, no, no, not necessarily. I mean, some, some aspects I think you're right, but there is a, a long history of interpretation on, you know, the... the Biblical, you know, all, all matter of biblical passages. There's a history of interpretation, and so we've, we've got a pretty clear the way the, the Jewish, the third, you know, the Jewish first century Jews, the, the, the uh, people in the time of, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the uh, David and so on, how they interpreted and understood the scriptures. So I wouldn't say that it's just an enlightened thing. See, the white man's probably not open to the spiritual side, where the Aborigine or Indigenous people are more open to the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. It's not a question. That they, they believe in that. The white man doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, yeah, that's a, that, that's true. Do you know, and it's a cultural thing in business. You'll find that um, you'll find that say in the Philippines, my brother's a mission in the Philippines. Um, uh, in the Philippines, <coughs> everyone is much more open to spiritual things. So mm -hmm. there is a much greater awareness of the spiritual. In Western countries, there's you know, see in Africa, you know, Christianity is growing, yeah. but they've got a, a the African tradition is they've got an openness to the spiritual realm. With, yeah. From their background, we're mm. Australian, yeah, it's kind of Australian it's world, or the Western, Western world, mm. have got a whole different idea of the spiritual mm. world. It's not world, really. So that we dismiss it, we're throwing it out with the bathwater, you know. Mm. So we're, we're coming now to a point where we're, we're looking at science to prove God, but we're, we're trying to put God into a box, or we're trying to, God actually operates outside of the box. Yeah, that's that, and that's what I think that is a problem when it comes to, um, well, particularly the first chapters of Genesis and, and other parts of the Bible as well, is that we're trying to read a, um, uh, we're trying to explain it all in scientific terms, when in fact it's clearly a supernatural account. For sure. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's past nine o'clock, and yeah. we'll turn into pumpkins. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so. I, I think the kind of um, Leonard's central point <laughs> came across, and um, I, I think most of us actually agree with it. Uh, that really, um, science should we should have a clear understanding of what the bounds are of the scientific method, and kind of be aware when people are actually um, breaking those boundaries. So, thank you very much for your contribution. It certainly <laughs> gave a lot of discussion. And...